In this video, we're going to take a look at Beer's Law. Um, we're going to introduce the concept and look at some sample data, um, analyze it graphically, and then ultimately use it to find the concentration of an unknown solution. Um, Beer's Law applies when you're looking at a colored solution and you're wondering about the concentration of that solution. I've got here a um, cuvette, a little plastic cuvette, uh, sort of like a test tube. Um, it has ridges on two sides that are opposite. Here's some ridges, here's some ridges that I can touch and hold. And then there's uh, clear sides on opposite sides here where light will pass through. Um, there's a few bubbles in this cuvette, so I would get rid of those bubbles just by tapping. Um, this cuvette has a green colored solution in it. Um, it's an unknown metal cation, and it gives the solution a green color when dissolved. Now, you ever think about why a solution is a color that you see? For example, this solution is green. It's in a cuvette like this. And we know that white light is entering the solution. White light contains all wavelengths of light from 400 to 700 nanometers. The entire rainbow of light is mixed in, in white light. But what we see when we look at the solution is a green color. So we see green because the green light is being transmitted. Green light is passing through that solution. That implies that other wavelengths of light are being absorbed by the solution. If you look at a color wheel, something you might be familiar with from an art class, um, you can see here the wavelengths of light, the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. The red end of the visible spectrum is the longer wavelengths, so 700 nanometers, the high, longer wavelengths. The purple end, the violet end, is the shorter wavelengths, so 400 to 450 nanometers. Our solution looked green, and green is over here in the 480 to 560 nanometer region. So our solution is transmitting these colors, wavelengths in this region. Well, what wavelengths then was it absorbing? Well, it was, it's absorbing a little bit of everything, but it's really transmitting green well. Is there a wavelength that it likely absorbs really well? Well, as a rule of thumb, if you look at a color wheel like this and you see that a solution looks green over here, then the color opposite on the color wheel is likely going to be a color where a set of wavelengths where the solution is absorbing really well. And we can verify that a little more quantitatively by looking at something called the absorption spectrum for the substance. Here is the absorption spectrum measured with something called a spectrometer or a spectrophotometer. And what it does is it takes the wavelengths of light from 400 nanometers, in this case, all the way up to 900, so into the ultra, sorry, the infrared region of the spectrum. Remember that visible light goes up to here, so here's the visible region of the spectrum. The 400 nanometer end is again the violet end, and the 700 nanometer end is the red end of the spectrum. And remember that green was up at around 500 nanometers in that range up there. If you look at this absorption spectrum at the 500 nanometer region, you'll notice that the absorbance of the solution is at its minimum at that point because it was actually transmitting these wavelengths. It wasn't absorbing them very well. But it does absorb really well over here in the violet end of the spectrum. And it also absorbs very well over here in the red end of the spectrum as we anticipate it. Okay? Now, if you had a spectrophotometer like this, a spectrometer, you might then choose a wavelength over here, or perhaps this wavelength right here, whatever wavelength that is, because it gives you a really strong absorbance. Now, Beer's Law is going to deal with the absorbance of light of certain wavelengths by colored solutions and how that absorbance relates to the concentration of the solution. So we could use, we could use wavelengths at either end of the spectrum to study this uh, particular solution using Beer's Law. So Beer's Law talks about the absorbance of a solution. And there's a little simple equation that Beer's Law can be summarized with. It says that the absorbance A is equal to EBC. 
Okay, now the AP exam will probably use a, an ABC, the lowercase a, but I prefer to use this Greek letter epsilon. Um, it's actually we're going to give it a name. It's going to be called the molar molar because we're going to measure concentrations and molarity. It's the molar absorptivity of the substance that is being dissolved. So for us, it would be the molar absorptivity of that metal cation. The letter B here stands for the path length. So in other words, it's the, it's the distance that the light travels through your solution. In our little cuvettes, we're going to shine light through the solution in this cuvette. And if you measured the distance that the light travels through, so the width of this cuvette, you'd find that for us, B is equal to one centimeter, which is going to be very nice mathematically. C, as you might guess, is the concentration of the solution, concentration in this case of the metal cation, and it's going to be in molarity, so it's the molar concentration. And then the A out front, again, is the absorbance. Now, absorbance is, is um, you know, we think of it intuitively as just the amount of light absorbed, but it actually has a little bit more of a rigorous definition. If you go back to our cuvette for a minute, and you imagine putting this cuvette into a device, in fact, let me just show you what, we'll, what we're going to be using. We're going to use something called a colorimeter. Okay, now that this colorimeter has four different wavelengths of light that you can shine through a solution. You open up the lid like this, and you take your cuvette, and you drop it in so that the, the sides with ridges that you can touch are on left and right, and the side where the light travels through is up and down like this in the direction of that white arrow you see up here. Okay, so I'm going to drop it in like this. Now I've already taken a tissue and I've dried it off completely and I've gotten rid of any air bubbles that are inside as well. There's no fingerprints, it's not wet. And I'm dropping it in like that and just closing the lid to prevent any other light from getting into that device. Um, I can select wavelengths by pressing these arrows back and forth. And we're going to use a wavelength over at the red end of the spectrum, but we're going to talk a bit more about this in just a moment. But we're now ready to shine light through that solution. Well, inside the colorimeter, there's a device which measures the intensity, the intensity of the light that's entering the solution. So from the light bulb that's inside, here's a light bulb, in this case a red bulb, there's an intensity of light that's going into our solution. There's a detector on the opposite side. So here's a detector that measures the intensity of the light that is transmitted through the solution. And if your solution absorbs light, then the intensity of light transmitted will be less than the intensity of the light that enters, I0. So you can measure the percentage. You can calculate the percentage transmittance rather easily. Just take the intensity of the light that was transmitted divided by the intensity originally and multiply by 100. There's your percent transmittance. And percent transmittances would go from 0 to 100 percent. If a solution transmits 100 percent of the light, then it's absorbing none of the light. And if it absorbs um, all of the light, then uh, there'd be zero transmittance, right? Nothing would get through. Now, absorbance can be calculated if you know the transmittance using a simple formula, 2 minus the logarithm, the base 10 logarithm of percent transmittance. So if you grab a calculator and, and consider, for example, if your percent transmittance was 100%, all the light went through, the log of 100 is 2. And so 2 minus 2 would give you 0. So when there's 100% transmittance, there's 0 absorbance. And so there's um, the relationship between transmittance and absorbance. Now, some older spectrophotometers uh, measure transmittance. Some newer ones measure absorbances for you automatically. I'm um, coming back to our solution. The solution that we have of our, of our metal cation is dissolved in water. Okay, it's dissolved in water, and water does itself absorb some light. Okay, if you've ever seen a deep sea diver go deeper and deeper in water, as the light passes through more and more water, um, more and more light gets absorbed. Um, so the water is absorbing light. What we're going to do, coming back to our colorimeter, and I'm going to show you now the computer that it's attached to. 
So I've got a computer here attached to this colorimeter. I'm going to take a, another cuvette. Technically, I should probably be using the same cuvette so that I reduce error. Um, the cuvettes may not be identical in every way. I'm going to take a cuvette and put it in, and this cuvette has distilled water in it, which is the solvent. And again, I put it through the clear sides or in the direction of the light. I'll close the lid, and I'm using 635 nanometers as my wavelength because that's a red color of light, which we've already agreed that this green solution will absorb very well. And now what I'm going to do is just press the Cal button on the colorimeter. Cal basically tells the computer to ignore the solvent, in this case water. And looking at the computer interface, it was actually already ignoring it, giving us an absorbance value of zero. So now you'll notice that with the water in the colorimeter, the computer basically thinks there's nothing there. Not, no light is being absorbed by the water at this point. Now if I take out my water and put my solution of the green chemical in here, close the lid again, you can now see a recording on the computer screen of 0.214. So there's the absorbance of this green colored solution. Now suppose you had created a set of solutions whose concentrations you know. What I've got here is some sample data. Okay, So I've created um, five different solutions of this metal cation, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 sorry, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 molarity. And I've gone ahead and done exactly what I've shown you a moment ago, but I've recorded the percent transmittance values here, just so that I can review with you again how to find trans the absorbance values. Absorbances, again, are, are calculated by using that formula 2 minus the logarithm of percent T. So the absorbance here for the first trial would be 2 minus the logarithm of 53.7. So if I just do that on my calculator here, 2 take away the logarithm of 53.7, I get an absorbance of 0 0.270. Now I can go through all of those values one by one and get their absorbances. Um, using the computer, as you saw, the computer would have just given me the absorbances automatically. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll go here and just show you that I've entered on my calculator already these concentrations from 0.2 to 0.6 molarity in my list 1, and I've put the transmittance values in list 2. So now I'm going to go to list 3 on my graphing calculator and just automatically convert those transmittance values to absorbance. So I'll put my cursor up on the L3 symbol. At the bottom of the screen it says list 3 equals, and it'll equal 2 take away the logarithm of list 2, which is where my transmittance values were. Enter, and now I've got my absorbances. So 0 0.410, 0 0.550, 0 0.690, and 0 0.821 are my absorbance values for the five solutions that I've prepared. Now that I've got those five solutions, notice I also did an unknown solution, so a solution whose concentration I didn't know. So let me just quickly take its transmittance value, which I measured with the colorimeter, and convert it to an absorbance. So to take away the logarithm of 35.8 is 0 0.446. Now notice that this absorbance value, 0.446, is in between this absorbance and this one here. So I'm predicting that the concentration of my unknown is going to be between 0.3 and 0.4 molarity. But let's get that value more, more directly. If you look back at Beer's law, they said that absorbance was equal to E, B, C. But we noticed that in our cuvettes, the value for B is one centimeter. And so if you put a one in where we have the letter B, you get a simpler looking equation that A is equal to just EC. And now this equation looks like the equation of a straight line. It looks like Y equals MX. So if we create a, a scatter plot with concentrations on our, X val on our X axis, so concentration of the metal 2 plus, and for my sample data that would run from 0 0.2 molarity up to 0 0.6 molarity, and on the y-axis, I'm going to put absorbance values. So the absorbance values here on the y-axis. Now, absorbances are unitless because they're 
based on these percentages and logarithms, so they're unitless. Don't have to worry about units there. And the absorbance values for me run from 0.27 to 0.82, so I might start at about 0.2 and go up to about 0.9 on my y-axis. And now let me just use the graphing calculator to graph those values quickly. So I'll go to the stat plot menu. I'll turn plot number one on. And I want for my X list, L1, list one, that's my concentrations. But I want for my Y list on my calculator, L3, that's where I had my um, absorbance values, L3. So I've got list one concentrations, and for me, list three is where my absorbances were. So now I'll graph, and remember to press zoom in option number nine if you don't see the graph automatically. So there's my five data points, and I'm just going to sketch that here. Two, three, four, five data points, something like that. Okay. Now, if we can find the equation, notice it is linear. It looks like a very nice straight line, which is what Beer's Law predicted. Okay. Beer's Law says there should be a linear relationship between absorbance and concentration, um, while the path length is held constant, that's one centimeter in this case. If we go back to the graphing calculator, we can find the equation of this line. We press the STAT button, we go to CALC, and then option number four is linear regression. And I'm going to say to do linear regression, my X values were in list one, comma, my Y values were in list three. And then I want it to graph this for me, so I'm going to put another comma I'm going to press the variables button, vars, and then go to y variables and functions, and I'm going to tell it to graph the equation as y1. And now press enter on my calculator, and there's the equation of my line. Now instead of y equals, I'll say a equals, because y is my y values are absorbances. The slope is 1.38. And instead of C, instead of X, which is generic, I'll use letter C for concentration, which is on my x-axis. And this, this gives me a very small y-intercept. Technically, with Beer's law, you should have no y-intercept. It should be zero, actually. But because of small errors, things like scratches in the cuvette, perhaps um, you're gonna, you might have a very small um, y-intercept. So I'm just going to include it, minus 0.0047. Now notice that's a very small y-intercept and you might just get away by ignoring it and saying that it's a zero. So there's the equation of my line. Now that I know the equation of that line, I know the relationship between absorbance and concentration for my nickel solutions, which again were measured at 635 nanometers. Since I've, now, since I've measured the uh, absorbance value, I've got the absorbance of my unknowns uh, my unknown solution, I can take that absorbance value and just put it into this equation to find the concentration. So if I take the absorbance value 0.446, that has to equal 1.38 times C, take away 0.0047. So let's just find C, and it'll be 0.446 plus 0.0047 divided by 1.3. And let's see if we get a concentration which we thought would be between 0.3 and 0.4. So here we go. Uh, 0.446 was the absorbance plus 0.0047 equals and divide by 1.38 and I get 0 0.327 which falls in the range that I had anticipated. So the concentration of the unknown metal was 0.327 molarity. Now, in the next stage of the, of the experiment that we're going to do, you have taken some brass pellets and you've measured the, the mass of your brass pellets. So you have the mass of brass. And we know that brass is made of copper and zinc. Um, the mass of brass, you've got some mass, I'm going to just make up a number here, 0 0.815 grams of brass. And I know that in this brass there's copper and there's zinc. Well, we're going to show um, in the lab that of those two substances, um, the zinc is colorless and shows very, very little to, to almost no absorbance at all in the visible spectrum. We're going to show that copper 
does absorb. It gives the solution a, a blue color, actually. We had a green solution a minute ago. Copper is going to give it a blue, solution, a blue color because we dissolved this brass in nitric acid, and the resulting solution is, is blue colored. And we're going to show that that's due to the, to the copper. Your job in the next por portion of our experiment is to take some solutions of copper sulfate pentahydrate. I'm going to give you some solid copper sulfate pentahydrate. And you're going to create for yourself a series of standard solutions, sort of like I did here. I went from 0.2 to 0.6 molarity. You'll have to decide what your range of concentrations should be. Now, one thing you might want to consider would be, suppose that this brass were completely made of copper. So if this were not 0.815 grams of brass, but rather 0.815 grams of copper, how many moles of copper would that be? You know that you took the dissolved solution and you, you diluted it to 50 milliliters. So if you can estimate how many moles of copper there would be if it were pure copper, and then use the volume of 50 milliliters, you can get an estimate of what the concentration of copper would be in your solution you made from the brass if it were pure copper. And of course, it's not pure copper. It's less than that. So that would give you a sense of what the maximum concentration of copper should be in your series of standard solutions. So one more time, if you were to take this mass of brass and consider it again it were pure copper, and you know that you dissolved it in nitric acid and then filled it up to 50.0 milliliters with distilled water. So if you assume it's pure copper, you can find the moles of copper, and then with the volume you can find the concentration of copper if it were pure copper. And since the actual copper concentration would be less than that, this could be a, a maximum concentration that you would use in your set of standards. So where I went up to 0.6 molarity, you'd go up to that concentration or something close to it. Then you would have to prepare a series of dilutions a series of dilutions to get down to a concentration lower than what you think that the copper concentration is in your 50 ml solution. The actual concentrations you use doesn't really matter, um, but you'll have to prepare a set of dilutions like you did in your original Beer's Law experiment. Then basically your job is to analyze the, the, the data in the same way that you saw me here do to figure out the concentration of copper that's in your dissolved brass solution. If you can find the concentration of, of copper in that solution, then you could work backwards. You can, you'd know the concentration and the volume. You could find the moles of copper. That would give you the grams of copper that was in the brass. And if you know the grams of copper in the brass, you can find the percentage of copper in the brass. And that is going to be the challenge that you and a partner are going to have to face in our next portion of the lab with Beer's Law.